Can I, uh, I wouldn't normally do this, but if I could get everyone, could I get everyone to stand to your feet for a moment? Uh, that would be really great. Just if you haven't done it, just turn to the person near you or next to you and just give them a Christian smile. Just something, just something very welcoming, you know, just, just say it's great to be near you and with you. Isaac, oh, you, Isaac, you can come back for one second. Yeah, I don't know how to pray without music, so. Um, I just want you to close your eyes, if you would, for a minute, and I'm going to pray for us. I felt, have felt led of the Lord this morning, had a, me- a message planned and prepared, and then um, have felt a need to bring a different message. So the thing is, though, depending how you feel about it, it may prove to be a good idea or a bad idea. We'll just see. But um, the reason I got you standing is I want to pray for you and me that we'd receive, be able to receive this word. If you are brand new here today, you know like a swimming pool, you know there's a shallow end and a deep end. So we're, we're, we're not even going in the deep end, we're going in the diving pool. <laughs> like, like we're, we're going so deep. So um, hopefully someone brought you, if you just came on your own, I'm just going to, my prayer is for you especially, but it's actually not just for you, it's for every person in this room. And so I want to just ask the Lord to bless this. Would you close your eyes? Would you um, open your hearts? Spirit of the living God, come fall afresh on us. For we draw near to you today because you have the words of life, Lord Jesus. No one else. For what I'm about to speak on, will require wisdom for both the speaker and the hearer. I pray at some point that your voice will take over and it will produce in us the fruit of all your word. So come by your spirit, come by peace and do a remarkable work. For I know, Lord God, your word says those who speak this message and hear it will be blessed. So let your people be blessed in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? As you grab your seat, flick your phone on flight mode and grab a seat and let's get into today. I'm going to talk on the book of Revelation and how Jesus breaks fear. The book of Revelation and how Jesus breaks fear. Revelation chapter 1, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him God gave Jesus to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is the report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God, bl- this is the thing, this is, this is, just keep this in mind. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy <laughs> to the church, and he blesses all, online as well, who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, which was um, minor Turkey, basically Asia Minor is Turkey kind of region. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and the one who is still to come. For the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is faithful witness. He is a faithful witness to these things. The first to rise from the dead is our Jesus, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. That's quite reassuring. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. I like to read that verse again. All glory to him who loves you and has freed you from your sins by shedding his blood for you. Hallelujah. I might need a new pulpit. He made, he's made us a kingdom of priests for our God and Father. All glory to him and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look. He comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes and amen. This book is unreal. It has, I actually did avoid it for a number of years of my um, young adult life and I may get into why I did that. But it has 22 chapters. It is the last book of the Bible. In it, you'll discover dragons, Beasts, fake prophets, vomiting, pretty much the typical visit to the Nayland College canteen. (laughs) This book makes Harry Potter look like Dora the Explorer. It's a book about the now. It's a book about the future. 
And it's actually even a book about what has been to lead to any point the reader reads. And you can read this book and it is po possible to get a little bit confused. I used to tell a joke when Rebecca and I were youth pastoring. Um, the three things that Christian youth in the 90s wanted to know. It was about number one, about sex. Number two, about the end times. And number three, will there be sex during the end times? That's all the Christian youth wanted to know about. Well, I'm not here to answer those questions today. But I want to give you a basic snapshot of what is going on in this book because there are two nations right now <laughs> who are ramping up, dropping bombs on each other. And so I think actually, to be fair, it's not a just a reaction to that. This was written, I'll just let you know, this message was written uh, prior to those events taking place. Uh, but it starts with seven letters to seven churches, does this book of Revelation. It's um, seven letters to seven churches in the region of Asia Minor, Turkey. They were actual people, actual churches. Jesus had specific messages to each of the churches. So it'd be like to the church of Annersbrook. Um, hey, how's it going? Peeps, you know, I don't know if he'd be that, he'd use everyday language now. And then he would write some things. And in these seven churches, there were different things going on, but some were being lazy with their faith. Others were losing their fire. Some had moved from their first love. Others had remained in their first love, so their relationship with Jesus, of which, by the way, I could sense this morning, there's a number of people here who have their first love to worship Him the way you worshipped Him. But there were some who were being persecuted, even killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. If you knew you'd be killed for your faith for ticking the census in New Zealand as being a Christian, that's the world they were living in. So I want to say from my standpoint, and this is, I did say that I avoided it in some of my younger, young adult years, but in my mid to now young adult years, it's not been a book I have avoided at all. And so therefore, I want to say, in my opinion, this book is not, I repeat, is not a secret code to the timing of the end of the world. Some of you are disappointed. You're like, you've put on calendars and everything. I was at, my mom, this is one of the reasons why I didn't read it. I was at my mum and dad's, which is, makes sense. I grew up there. I was at home <laughs> one Sunday. This random dude had turned up and he was out on the deck at our house in Bishopdale. I would have been 11 years old. And he comes out, he, it was just me and him out on the deck. He would have been in his 30s, 40s. Now, I don't know, I could be wrong. But you know how some of you have spirulina as like a supplement? Well, he was having supplements, but it wasn't spirulina. And he said to me, he goes to me, I was 11 years old, he goes, you know Jesus is coming back into this year. And I was like, what? I was very confused. Um, and, and, he, and he began to tell me some things that were very, very uh, concerning. I want to say to you that um, Jesus is going to come back. He was right there, but it wasn't at the end of that year, okay, obviously, unless this is some big dream or, um, or some weird twisted movie plot. Instead, the book of Revelation is full of images, events, and prophetic messages to comfort and warn believers. I want to repeat it again, to comfort and to warn believers in Jesus. And what Jesus does here is really get people, listen, serious about their stand for him. Because he shows John some really vivid imagery. And they would know, this group listening to it, not to give up on their faith, not to lose their faith, and not to just throw it all away cheaply. Listen, because in the end, it will all be worth it. That was the message. So what happens? Well, Jesus shows John. Um, it's John on the island of Patmos. He'd been, it was on the Lord's Day. Uh, he had been there worshipping on a Sunday. I know it's quite a novel idea for some Christians today. I know some people think the Bible, se Bible verse says, forsake not the mountain biking together, as some are in the habit of doing. Anyway, he's worshipping on Patmos or water skiing or whatever it might be. Just thought I'd include water sports in it. He's worshipping and John says that there is a dragon. He sees an image of a dragon that comes out of the sea. And there is a war between the dragon and the dragon's followers and a lamb. That's really odd. As the lamb appears, because who's going to win a battle between a dragon and a lamb? But as the lamb appears to fight, it's already, it appears already covered in blood. 
Sound familiar? Sound at all familiar? And in the battle between the dragon and the lamb, guess who triumphs? The lamb triumphs over the dragon and all of the dragon's evil power. Then the dragon, as well as the beast, there's a beast and a false prophet who try to destroy the lamb and the followers of the lamb, they're all then thrown into a lake of fire. Then death, sickness, pain are destroyed. This is good news, forever, forever. He's saying in this plot, in this prophetic story, there is a day coming where sickness, pain, and, 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 and the fall of the human, mental health issues, financial issues, challenges that are just, we've got so used to that we think are so normal, are gone and destroyed forever. There are even other historic moments in this book. Global events mentioned that have been fulfilled, prophesied, prophetic messages that have been fulfilled. But this book is a gift from God to encourage you and to warn you that if you are a follower of Jesus, not to give up, not to bow down, because your reward as well is going to be so incredibly great, it's going to blow your mind. And honestly, the reward for those who stand for God. You know, this morning I believe that God wants to use this message to break some of the fear off our lives that we've actually tolerated and accepted. I'm talking, yes, about fear that you might get when you read the headlines. Fear in terms of maybe you've got kids growing up in this world now and they're going to be adulting and you're wondering how the heck are they going to do it. Some of the fear around maybe your own kids raising kids and you're a grandparent or you're going to be a grandparent. Not too soon, I hope. But, you know, you... But I, I, I want to encourage you that not everyone would know this, but I grew up very fearful. I, I was very f- afraid. First thing I was really afraid of was death. And you go, yeah, duh. Well, I had a really odd fear with death because I'd had all these health issues growing up, these anaphylactic asthma attacks where I had been, um, all of a sudden my airways closed and had to be a number of times resuscitated. Um, one time worked in my favour. It was the time that Rebecca had friend zoned me clearly. We were hanging out, had one of these attacks, and the last thing I said before I collapsed and went blue was, I've got to tell you one thing. And I didn't give her some Bible verse. I said, I love you. (laughs) Hey, it got me out of the friend zone. But I was afraid. I was afraid of death. I was afraid. And that meant I was afraid of the future. I was also, I just want to see if if we're on the same cultural page right now. I was also afraid of Miss Piggy. I'd have nightmares of her chasing me down a hallway, up some stairs, and who was there? The two elderly gentlemen at the end. (laughs) I'd have these nightmares. The only time that this fear would stop was when I was prayed for or when I heard God's word preached. It was the only time. Did you know? There's 145 verses regarding not fearing. Fear not, God says for I am with you. Do not be afraid, I will help you. 2 Timothy 1.7, for it is not God who has given you a spirit of fear. Listen to me. It is not God who has given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you a spirit of what? Love, power, and sound thinking. That's God. So therefore, if you're riddled like I was with fear and, and concern and worry at that level, that kind of level, I just want to say, it's not God operating in your life. Something else is wanting to operate. And you might be like, hey, hey, you said there was a dragon? Like, that's my new fear. (laughs) But but I want to show you three things happening in the book of Revelation that I believe will not only encourage you, but I believe in these days. This is the See, whether Jesus turns back up tonight at 6.15 p.m., I don't know why, That's quite a specific, I realise. Or whether it's in a thousand years, every believer ever since Jesus has had to live in the tension that either one day you'll stand before Christ because you've passed from this life to be absent from the body. So you've had to face your own mortality. That's normal human behaviour, to face your own mortality. Or you will see Christ coming. You will see Him. Everyone will see Him. It is a global event. And so to understand that, 
I believe will encourage you and help to destroy fear in your life. How so? Okay, well, I think the first thing that we discover that breaks fear, can break fear, is number one, that Jesus himself is the beginning and the end. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. I, John, your brother in Christ and partner in suffering in God's kingdom and in patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and my personal testimony, testimony about Jesus. It was a Sunday, the Lord's Day. I was worshipping in the Spirit. Suddenly, I heard a noise behind me, a voice like a trumpet blast. The voice said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in these following cities. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I turned and saw seven gold lampstands. So these cryptic prophetic images, I have two reasons. One is to spark the imagination of God in you, but also because these churches were being persecuted, they were using Old Testament and Israeli code and pictures for people to understand. So these seven gold lampstands appears where? In the temple. So that's a, a temple reference. Standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with the gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, and they were white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like the mighty ocean waves. He held seven sta stars in his right hand, and the sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. Remember, prophetic imagery. And his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. Now, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I was dead. It was too much to take in. But he laid his right hand on me and he said, Do not be afraid. I, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not any other man-made or even historic God, I, Jesus Christ, hold the keys of death and the grave. Most of the issues of your fears are coming from one place, and that is simply not knowing. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we came from. We don't really know where we're going. Why stuff happens, we don't know. Or how we're going to fix it, we don't know. Ultimately, we wonder, are we even going to be okay? And that's what causes fear. Fear, someone said, is false evidence appearing real. Because half of the things we fear never eventuate. But the emotion of fear is very real for, for a lot of people. But what if we knew someone who did know all of those things? What if that person could love you, help you, guide you, heal you, provide for you, forgive you, save you. And what if you knew no matter what happened, you would only ever end up, your worst case scenario would be, you would end up with that one who loves you forever. What if your worst case scenario, that as a believer, as a believer, it's, it's very limited this, <laughs> as a believer, what if your worst case scenario is what? you end up in the loving arms of Jesus Christ. That's your worst case. I know this challenge. I know this pain. I know this suffering. I know this stuff that goes on. But at the end of it all, the end of it all, what if you knew that? And our kids, when they were growing up, there was a couple of moments in parenting that I really battled with. And of the particular ones was, at night when I was pretending to be asleep. What I mean by pretending to be asleep to all the husbands, it's a little hack for you uh, for your future. Although now that I've mentioned it, it won't be a hack anymore. And that is you hear the baby cry and you hear the baby cry and you hear the baby cry and you tell yourself something like, I've got to work tomorrow. And then you think, oh, well, Rebecca can do it. And then she gets up and says something like, didn't you hear that? but you best not answer. You best, honestly, not answer. You're not looking happy. I'm so sorry for all the times. One of the things that happened, though, was 
you know, you'd feel this kick from the bed, you know? Because we're not, we're not in single beds. So, we kick. <laughs> Why would my, all our grandparents in sing? Anyway, I, what happened was, you get this kick, and then you'd hear this baby. That's a serious question, but anyway, you hear this baby. And, and, and when they got a bit older, old enough to get up and go to the toilet themselves, that you'd go into the room, it was dark. Dad, dad, dad. You're like so tired. You, yeah, what is it? You're thinking there's some issue. There's a burglar. There's an actual burglar. Like, like, like the roof has come off entirely. What's the matter? What's happening? I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. What are you afraid of? I need to go to the toilet. And it's like just to go to the bathroom, the amount of fear, simply because of what? It's dark. So you turn on the light. You grab their hand. You're thinking in your mind, come on. You've got to be, this person's got to be more intelligent than this. Surely. And you grab their hand and you walk them off to the toilet. And you, in, in a daze, they go to the toilet and then you, then you walk them back to their bed and you put them back into bed and you think, come on, man, she's 20 now. Come on. <laughs> and then you go back. There's this point in time where the body language between the dad, 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 I'm so afraid, dad, dad, dad. The body language. I had a number of times I was walking them down the hallway in the light and they were kind of like, what are you doing, dad? I was like, you know, can I get something to eat? It's like total change, total change. Total change. I, I really believe and know that not only in these days, but in this life, that when you have Jesus, a relationship with a living Jesus, when you actually have, Je this is what this is about. This is what today's about. This is what this word is about, is that He can come into your life, not as a religious idea, but as a living presence. He is one whisper away. Jesus, He doesn't mind you waking Him up. He never sleeps nor slumbers anyway. He doesn't go to sleep. But I'm telling you today that you have a living Saviour. And He said, because this brings security, is He said, I want you to know whatever you're facing and whatever you will face, I've always been at the beginning. And whatever you go through and whatever you're gonna go through, and I'm gonna be at the end to pick you up. You know, death, you know, death, what cured death, the fear of death for me, was the fact that I knew what Paul wrote was true. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment, people, I had someone ask me at a funeral, her husband had died suddenly, unscheduled, unplanned. She was moved by grief. She'd be in her 70s. She came up to me at the funeral, the wife of the man passed away and said, tell me, what does the Bible say? Because she didn't know. what He, he was a believer. She didn't know what the Bible said though. She said, what has happened? She was so distressed at the start of this funeral. No peace, no comfort. So I stood there and I told her the Word of God. I said, I know exactly what's happened to your husband. The moment he breathed his last breath, his spirit was released from his body. And to be absent from the body for a believer is to be present with the, like that, like that. So I'm here to declare to you, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, how difficult or big or small or medium it is, Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end. You can find new beginnings in Him and no matter what is gonna happen, He will receive you on that day. And that, my friends, breaks fear. Why? Because I know, I know. Like, how do you know? You just get it in your spirit until you know. You allow God to breathe on you until you know. He's your security. He loves you. The second thing that the book teaches us and reveals to us that has the power to break, and I'll just add some everyday fears, is number two, is that it demands of us that we've got to make a choice on whether we worship Jesus or worship the world whether we worship Jesus. And now I'm not just talking about singing, but singing is a great mechanism to express it. Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like the, those of the lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all authority of the first beast and he required all the earth and all the peoples to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. I just want a little side note. If you believe in the Christian message, there is good and evil. Good is founded in, in our God, in Jesus Christ, and evil is found in everything outside of Him 
that is Satan. And just, I read you something you might not have really paid attention. Satan's goal in destroying everything in sight is ultimately to gain worship from people. That's all he's after. What is, what is worship? Again, it's not a sweet song to Satan. He's not after your, your verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Coda. That's for the musicians. What he's after, what is worship? We're about to find out. And with all the miracles he was doing, he was allowed to perform to deceive all the people who belong to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship him die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. I like this next verse. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for the number of the man, his number is six, six, six. Six, six, six was very confusing to me growing up. I hated maths anyway. I was just really bad at it, right? I was bad at all subjects, apart from um, wagging. John, who wrote this, listen, don't miss this. John, who wrote this, actually spoke his language was Hebrew and Greek. And in those languages, numbers actually had letters associated. We don't have it in New Zealand, uh, English language, New Zealand language. Um, see, not good at maths or English, it's great. These letters 666 six, six, spell out a word, and I'm going to bring it up on the on the screen, these, this, these were prophetic images and prophetic codes written to seven churches who were being persecuted and needed like, not riddles, but they needed underground messaging, really. The 666 that they knew in their language spelt two key words. And the words were Nero Caesar and Beast. So the, 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 the numbers 666 spell with the letters Nero Caesar and Beast. And that passage said, that people who took the number 666 on what? Their forehead or their hand were loyal or worshipped the beast. The people who first read this would have known immediately Deuteronomy chapter 6. A thousand years before Revelation is written, Deuteronomy was written, and it said in Deuteronomy 6, Moses said, put God's word on your forehead and hand. So again, these imaging and imagery are completely relevant to a group of people who grew up with the Torah or the law of Moses, and we have them. We have it all in our, in our Bible. Well, the mystery to solve is this. You ready for it? If all you think about and if all you do is for the powers of the world to make a coin, to be famous, to be somebody, to get even, to... Have it your way, to live for what you feel, to entertain. If it's all you think about and all you do, then that's what you worship. And that's massive because what you worship or pledge your allegiance to, what you see that has ultimate value, is what you become like. We have hours in our day where we think about things and we do things. And we become like the things we worship. But how do we know that Jesus is worthy? And how do we know that we should give over our lives to him? Well, the answer is this. As opposed to the world that ultimately ends in death, when you worship Jesus, you get free. You get peace. You get born again. You become a new creature on the inside of you. You get healed. You get a vision and purpose. You get direction. You live forever. You do not die when you worship Jesus. So I'm going to say it as plainly as I can today. Do not bow down to the beast. Nero Caesar is a political ideology 
representing rulers of the world. It may as well, if you want be, want it to be, America, China, Rome. But it can also be political figures, political powers. Will that play into the future where a political system makes us bow down to it and forsake our Christian faith? Well, it already has in the past. There's no reason to think it might not happen again in the future. But you have a choice every day anyway. The ideologies are trying to suck you in through algorithms. And this is not, I have a phone. I have a laptop and an iPad. I'm not talking, I'm, I'm not banging on about, you know, we need to get a tin can and go up to the mountains. Up to the aerial, guys, Bishopdale, later this afternoon. Bring your tins, but bring a tin opener, okay? It's not time for joking. We're talking about 666. But when you bow down, when you put God's Word in your thoughts and in your actions, you live. Fear cannot stay in that place. You, you and me have got to start getting a little bit mad with the powers that are trying to draw us in for our loyalty. So will there one day be a, a we, we were told there'd be barcodes and a barcode on the forehead, barcode on the hand because we didn't have pay wave. So could there be a digital paying system that is a flow on? It could happen. Again, Book of Revelation is not a decoding mechanism to understand all of the things and the timings of the world. God is trying to get it sorted now. Maybe it does happen. Maybe it doesn't. But people in this room, whether you've got the barcode or whether you've got a chip, it, there's a loyalty to things that are not bringing you life. The, the only way I can say it is they end in death. If all you live for is money, if all you live for is your children and what their interests are, if all you live for, if you've lost your, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and let you lose his soul, Jesus said. And so He calls us day in, day out to not bow. So I'm better to tell you whether or not there's a one world global mechanism or a digital, it is, there's a possibility. But I'm here to tell you today, don't bow down. Don't bow down. Don't get behind the thing that looks shiny and cool, behind the thing that looks all awesome, there's a spirit behind it that wants you to worship Him and this is a tough message. It does lead to death. It leads, it leads to spiritual death. Some people in the room, you've, you've experienced mental health death. There's no living thought. The Bible says that in Christ, we can have the mind of Christ. How do you get a healthy mind? You base your thoughts on the Word. You have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? You see ultimate loyalty, or ultimate worth, ultimate worship to Jesus Christ. Thirdly and finally, this book reveals to us God's plan for the end of all time. And I, it's to me, it's incredibly encouraging. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the, new, the sea was gone. And I saw a holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a beautiful bride dressed for her husband. All this imagery is stunning, eh? I heard a loud, I mean, weddings are awesome things. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home. He's now home among His people. Yay! What, all of this time, ever since the fall of man to this point here we're reading, it's all been about God wanting and yearning to be back home amongst His people. <laughs> It could have been getting you to slave your butt off and work for him and he just wants to be with his people. And the ones sitting on the, oh, by the way, in that time, they'll wipe away every tear from their eye. And there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And all these things are gone forever. And the ones sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Listen, when a person gives their life to Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 explains this. They are a new creation. He makes you new on the inside. Um, I, many people have experienced this. I've experienced that. When I actually gave my life to Jesus. But that's within you. Your friends are still annoying. Your kids say no more. Your parents. But because of Jesus, you can love those annoying people. Why? Because something changed in you. What is it? 
Ezekiel, Jeremiah, God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Not when Christ returns, but when Christ comes to your life. Okay, cool. But that's the inside. The world's still screwy. There's still brokenness and pain. Evil is still on the loose. People are still dropping bombs on each other. But one day, and I'll, and I'll say very soon because it's, it's a lot longer since this book was written to now. So therefore I can say it's quite soon in proportion. Even what is on the outside will change. Listen to me. Every rock, every tree, every blade of grass, Romans says, is eagerly awaiting the sons of God to be revealed. And they will be made new too. All of creation will no longer be in decay. And that has broken fear off me. When I die, I'll be made new. When you die, you'll be made new. You're gonna be a paradise. But beyond that, the future is so much brighter, so much greater, so much more. And that's the reason for your hope. You see people driving around and it's all over their faces. No hope. You see people making decisions. No hope. They make decisions based on things because they feel no hope, have no hope, but they've never taken time to find out that Romans 5 says, may the God of all hope encourage you even unto that day. What day? The day which we're all awaiting for, for everything to, oh Graham, this sounds like pie in the sky. Sweet, that's cool. But just answer me, riddle me this. What other hope have you found? What other hope have you found? Did it not collapse like a tower of cards? Did it not actually show you in the end, I was just doing it for the temporal, for the immediate? Come on, show me. Even with great marriages, you know, Jesus said in heaven, there'd be no need for marriage. And I think Rebecca has that printed on her cupboard wall at home. She's like, this is a great hope. This guy, man, this guy. And Jared and I were talking about it during the week. Why? Not because of you, Alicia, and not because of you, Rebecca. You're great wives. You're his wife. We don't believe in polygamy. She's my wife. Anyway, believers start praying right now. Something's happened. <laughs> And Jesus said, because someone goes, oh, Jesus, what about marriage in heaven? And Je shivers, it's 11 past 11. Oh. I'm telling the story. Yeah, I'm telling the story. No, no, it's all good. That was my introduction, all that. So, um, so anyway, Jesus goes, what, but what was my story? Oh yeah, about marriage. So Jesus goes, so they asked Jesus, hey, there's a guy and his wife died. Um, is this right? A woman and her husband died and she married the next brother and next brother as it was permitted in the law. And, and they all go because they're trying to trap Jesus. So Jesus, because they didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in a, a renewed uh, life, a life of that's all new. And so um, they go, oh, so Jesus, so who's married to who in heaven? Because she's had um, seven husbands now. And he goes, oh, guys, there's no marriage in heaven. And everyone's gasping like, why? And he says this, because I just want you to grasp it now because he's gonna make all things new. He said, for in that place, there shall be no need for all intimacies and ecstasies shall be with our God. When I, Rebecca and I, there's some ecstasies, right? Mainly on trips to Glassons and came up, but that's irrelevant. You know, there's some, there's some moments, there's joy that, and, it, and it brings a fulfilling, a rewarding. It's not that it doesn't mean anything. What it means is in heaven, at the right hand of God, are pleasures and joy forevermore. Everything is gonna be made new. It's been called the cosmic party. And that's your future. And I don't know why, but it just breaks every fear. If you dive deep into this hope, this hope is alive. It breaks every fear. It breaks. And so you're like, why did you share this message? Is it just because Iran are like going to be and Israel are going to be? And what about other nations? It's not actually just that. I, I think there's probably relevancy. You know, Jesus said, when you see these things happening, know that the fruit is nearly ripe on the vine. So there's a relevancy to it. Here's what I think. I think we're living in days where the devil will expect every single one of us to be afraid, timid, and useless. But I've got a message for him, and I've got a message for you, the church. It is the very, you can tell, I've got a flipping bee in my bonnet today. 
We are not afraid. We are very bold. My life, your life is hidden in Christ. No matter what happens, I'm not bowing down. But it's going to start tomorrow. I'm not bowing down to the dollar. I'm not bowing down to the things. I'm not bowing down. I worship Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He set me free. I'm making a decision. And the boldness that is released from my heart and the, and the faith that it brings, it brings freedom. This message, it's only one book in the Bible. But man, and I see you getting very bold. I see you getting very, very bold. In fact, I see you getting fear and just being able to say, you know what? Jesus is at the beginning and the end. Do you know what? I'm not bowing down to it. I'm standing strong. Do you know what? In the end, it's all gonna be worth it because not only is there a reward, but He's making everything new. And I want you to receive it today. There is a hope. It's such a great hope. It's such a mighty hope. Now, are there more things around that? Who's the dragon? Who's the beast? Don't be so quick. Don't be so quick. You know, don't, don't have wisdom. But today, today is the day once again to decide, will you worship Jesus? Here's your little reward if you do. Fear is gonna go running in your life because you know you are in the palm of His hand. Can you say amen? Can you say aloud amen? Can you give God some praise because He's your hope? Can you give Him some real praise? Come on, let's stand on our feet right now.